Over the past few weeks, the United States has erupted in protests in response to the murder of George Floyd, yet another unarmed black man who died at the hands of a white police officer. If it was just one person, there wouldn't be protests all over the United States. It's not just one person. It is many people in a short amount of time across our history. That was Dr. Danielle K. Kilgo. She is a journalism professor from the United States and an expert in representation of minorities in the U.S. media. She's joining us today to talk more about the Black Lives Matter protests and what journalists can do to better understand the story. Danielle, hi. I'm so happy that you're with us today. Can, you, can we start with you telling us a little bit more about your work? Sure, so um, most of my work focuses on the representation of marginalized communities in the United States. Um, and so I started, really my work starts at the death of Trayvon Martin and the protest that, the, the international protest that really um, began to bubble up after his death um, and the acquittal of George Zimmerman. It was the moment that I saw it in the media in a way I had never seen it before. It was also a time when everybody started to connect on social media. And so I was seeing what the news was producing, but I was also seeing what meme makers were producing and just the amazing and sometimes atrocious and sometimes just, just the despair that was in that I that I felt when I saw some of the images and some of the the messages that were being pushed forward. It, it started really an obsession with um, how how do people think the way they think, and how can we get people to care about um, uh, the important issues in our world. So when you started looking at this issue from that scientific social sciences type perspective, what did you find? So a lot of my work, um, a lot of my published work, really starts in the in the mainstream media and. Um, uh, so I looked at the patterns in some of the nationally circulated newspapers from their printed and, and digital coverage. And uh, for, for Trayvon Martin, it, it, the protest that, that, um, that happened after his death and, and especially after the trials, a lot of them were, it was a little bit different. There wasn't a lot of national riots or violence or whatever word we're going to place on these sort of rebellions against the, um, against police brutality or against um, just brutality against black men and women and children in the United States. Um, but the coverage was, it, it had a significant amount of, of this idea that the protests might be violence. It was a big trigger for, for me to see how many times um, there were quotes about, please don't be violent. <laughs> we think you might be violent, right? And these are really crimes that, that help us think in ways that, um, uh, or think more in the stereotypical ways that these kinds of protests are represented. This issue of representation is so important. Another major moment you've studied is the Ferguson protests following the death of Michael Brown another young black man who died at the hands of a white police officer. How did it play out in the media then? In Ferguson, the Ferguson protest happened, you know, a lot of the coverage that I saw focused um, much more on the, the protesters' tactics, the violence, the drama, the potential for more drama, the National Guard being come in to, to curtail the drama. And it was a lot less about protesters' demands, the fact that it was 100 plus days of peaceful protest, and, and that was not represented in the coverage that we saw. So now with the George Floyd protests, how are you noticing these trends play out? You know, I have seen the good and the bad so far, um, and it's been really transformative and amazing to see some of the journalism that has paid very close attention to police behavior, which mm -hmm. is not typical. Um, they have uh, paid a significant amount of attention to police repression. Um, however, I just was reading an article that showed the many front pages of the newspapers and what they looked like. And um, a lot of them were protesters standing on cars and protesters by fires and anger and badness. And, and that's really, I mean, that really falls on that delegitimizing side of the scale. Yes, people are angry, but that's not the substance of the protest. It's not the um, reason why, why they're there. They're not there because they're angry. They're there because someone died, right? They're there because so many people have died before them. They're there because of economic inequality, because of racism in its many forms. And that is not what you see on those front covers. What is something you think journalists could do a better job with when covering the story? One of the things that I think would be good um, 
for journalists to think about is history as news. If, if we can understand that, that racial injustice and economic inequalities and disparities in the Twin Cities communities and beyond have not been covered prominently, and they are news to a lot of people, <laughs> if we can take that and we can hold that as really important, we can put we can put the protesters' grievances up front, right? And so I think that if we can think about the history, not just George Floyd's death, but what George Floyd's death represents, and to remember that that is news to a lot of people, and it's not news to protesters, but that's, that's, that's what they need to be heard and to be seen. If it was just one person, there wouldn't be protests all over the United States. It's not just one person. It is many people in a short amount of time across our history. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot for a community to digest. It's a lot for um, the black communities in the United States to digest and, and around the world. It would be um, a neglect to say that these issues aren't happening in other countries as well. And I think it's also really important to think about official sources, perhaps as somewhat unofficial, <laughs> and weigh the costs of including them in coverage. Um, a lot of the things that we've heard in the past and in the future <laughs> will be and are dog whistles. Um, they are racist statements. They are completely negative and unwarranted and unfair, not just for protesters, not, not for a particular movement, but for society, for, for society. And we're trying to, to push towards post-racialism. We, we may never achieve it, but we're still trying to push towards progress. And in pushing towards progress, it's really important not to amplify and maximize racist statements because they're atrocious. Obviously, covering a story like this takes a tremendous toll on Black journalists. Can you tell us what white journalists and non-Black journalists can do to just support our colleagues during this time? That's a hard question. Um, it, it, this, is, this is a tough issue. It, it's a tough issue, and a lot of times, especially in large newsrooms, there isn't enough diversity for for journalists of color to build a community they need to, um, to get through the trauma. I think it starts with reaching out, with us, you know, understanding journalists should read books instead of relying on our colleagues to explain things to them. There are so many amazing resources out there to catch up to speed on at least one or two perspectives. I can't speak for an entire black community, but I can't say for me, the trauma is, is deep and it's hard. And there's no getting around the fact that you have to see a man die on the streets every day. There's no, no getting around the fact that that could be my son or that could be my dad or, you know, that could be somebody close to me one day. And that trauma can't leave us when we go report or when we go research or, and so that those just key moments of solidarity, just moments of connecting, um, I think are, are important. I think that's a wonderful idea to leave our viewers with. Reach out, educate yourself, show solidarity. Thank you so much, Danielle. Good luck with everything. Oh, thank you. Thank you. If you want to know more about Dr. Kilgo's work, check out some of her studies linked here in the description below, where we also have a couple of our own resources as Media Diversity Institute about racial justice and journalism. Thank you so much for watching and stay tuned.